the name of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We'll continue our study in the book of Proverbs. We are in chapter 13. Today we'll go over, uh, we'll start from verse 10. If you guys remember, this section talks about how people manage wealth, manage their money. And this becomes an important part uh, for our life. Verse 10 starts by saying, By pride comes nothing but strife, but with well advised is wisdom. By pride comes nothing by strife, but with well advice is wisdom. Obviously, a lot of conflict happens because of financial dispute. It's actually what breaks some families apart. People fight over heritage, fight over certain transaction. So money has become a, a problem where pride can be manifested. But wisdom is characterized by peace, by peacemaking and not by fighting. If you guys remember in the story of Abraham and Lot, his nephew, Abraham was older and he had more authority. But when the conflict rose between Abraham and Lot, what happened? In Genesis 13, Abraham told him what? He told him, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go right. And if you go right, I will go left. So what happened with Abraham, Abraham said, you know what? I have two choices to make. I could make my relationship with Lot a priority and I could try to save it. Or I could make my financial gain a priority. And because Abraham chose peace, God blessed him actually. And God protected him. And God has given him more. And that becomes a challenge because we live in a very materialistic world. So every parent, for example, has a choice between working too much versus taking care of their kids. And some parents actually, they offer, uh, they make financial sacrifices on the financial quality of life so they can take care of their kids. Uh, for example, we also can make a lot of decisions about, for example, if I have a friend who's struggling, I could say, you know what, I want to take care of them, or I could choose my own comfort. Pride and selfishness become extremely related. And this passage here really focuses so much on how pride causes people to fight and to argue. The person who's prideful, he is not willing to listen to advice, and he puts his opinion above the rest. And most of the time, he's not able to sacrifice. And more importantly, he's not even able to see his own faults. Like, for example, you find people fighting, and somebody will be like, well, she started, he started. But how was your response? Was your reaction appropriate to the mistake they have made? Or did I exceed a reasonable even reaction? Quite often, a person who is prideful, he looks at the fault of other people. Somebody will be like, Abuna, this person doesn't care about me. Why? Because he doesn't reach out. You reach out to that person and be like, Abuna, this person asked me not to call them. But didn't you ask them not to call we pick and choose the things that will make us feel good about ourselves. It's common in terms of strife where people say, yes, I made a mistake, but this person did one, two, three, four, five. And the whole focus becomes on the other person's mistake. This is the attitude that creates strife. Because it looks what pride tries to justify me and tries to elevate me and not tries to make peace with others. This becomes a big problem. But those who are wise, they have the modesty and the humility to seek wisdom. There's actually a nice story 
about Father Abuna Lu'as al Darus. Um, at some point, he he was taking care of the poor. But then, in Egypt, sometimes obviously some of the poor are not always poor. Some of them try and try to you know trick the system to take more money from the church. So Abuna Lu'a found out about somebody who was you know abusing the system. So when he came to take money, Abuna told him, "What you did, what you're doing is wrong. It's not appropriate to abuse the system." And he kind of you know give him few kada'i words. When Abuna Lu went to talk to his father of confession, Father Mikhail Ibrahim, and told him the story and told him, you know, I found out that he, he was going to other churches and he's abusing the system and all that stuff. Abuna Mikhail told him something that was so beautiful. Told him, so you let him leave the church broken hearted? You let him leave the church sad? That's what happens when we get counseling from fathers and people who are wiser and who have experience with God. He continues about wealth. He said, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. Here he's really talking about a couple of ideas. One idea is the idea of easy money. People who want to make money quickly. Like, how can I get rich very fast? And sometimes they use illegal ways, ways that they use to lie or at the expense of others and it becomes a problem. The, the Proverbs actually talks about a gradual and steady accumulation of wealth. People who are working slowly by slowly, reasonably. The focus is not the wealth itself, the focus is God, but God blesses them in the meantime. And this is important because we have some time to examine our intention. Like somebody will be like, my main goal in life is to retire when I'm 40. Okay? Maybe this is not the correct goal. Maybe this is not the goal that God has for you. Somebody says, I want to be a millionaire by 30. Of course, if he wants to be a millionaire by 30, he will find a job that brings a lot of money. Sometimes these jobs... Uh, could actually make them lose their own soul. So it becomes, a, it becomes a, a question of people who are trying to collect money quickly. And the idea of money consumes their minds. And in reality, men fall into that problem more than women. Because men tend to really be obsessed with future planning and financial planning. Another idea also that the rich person who did not install the spirit of hard, of hard work in their children, all what they have built will be lost. If we don't teach our kids that they have to work hard and gradually succeed and give them everything in a silver platter, everything that they will take will, be, will disappear. There is greater virtues to teach our children than leaving them financial security. One of the youth one time told me something beautiful. He told me, Abuna, one of the things that impacted me the most is seeing my father every night praying the 12th hour, no matter how late he comes. It's something he always does. That's something they left to their children. There's a beautiful young lady, her dad passed away, and she held on to his Bible, even though she doesn't understand Arabic, but because his Bible was worn out from how much he reads it and how much he spends time with it. So it's important to keep that in mind. There's a, a lot of mysteries that happens in patience. A lot of great work that, does, that God does while we're patient and learning to enjoy our day with Him every moment. Another idea you can look at is that people whose heart attached to money in the second coming, they'll be ashamed. And look at the example of Job. Even though he lost all his finances, he's still able to keep his soul. 
And there's a lot of people that might reach that point and they abandon God. Even some people told him, curse God, move away from God. When he got into such a great hardship, but he was able to save his soul because what? Because he was gradually, he gradually collected his relationship with God and gradually built a lot of faith with God. He did not assume a certain relationship that did not exist and he was able to, uh, the, to be saved in the time of tribulation. From verse 12 to 19, talks about fulfillment through wisdom versus frustration through foolishness. So wisdom will give us fulfillment, frustration will, foolishness will give us frustration. He says, hope, the third, makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So he's talking here about what? He's contrasting two people, people who have unfulfilled expectation and people who have fulfilled desires. Okay? The word, by the way, deferred does not mean that it's going to come later. It means never ending extension of time. It never happens. People who have desires that will never happen. They lose spirit, they lose their soul. They become hopeless, they lose morale. Why? Because their longings are never satisfied. Why the longings are never satisfied? Because if they receive money, they want more money. If they receive fame, they want more fame. And some people, because they have gained their wealth and used unorthodox means, eventually they live a life of anxiety. It's actually, if you guys have ever heard about uh, a guy by name Sam Bankman, he was one of the people that created the FTX uh, cryptocurrency exchange. And obviously it was, it was a scheme, it was a, it was a scam. But he was talking to some of the people close to him and they, he told them that I know one day I'm going to go to prison. He was a billionaire, but living in the back of his head that this is all going to go soon, I'm going to go to prison. It's a life of hopelessness, even though from outside it looks as if it's a, a dream life, but it's not. Sometimes people's, all their life dream is to make money or to revenge it from somebody. I remember one of the fathers told us a nice story. He said he had a young man in his church and all his dream was to get married. He spent many years searching for the one, trying to get married and putting all his effort in the girl that he would marry. And then he said he came to Abuna after he got married and he told him, I don't know what to do now. I got married, but what's next? Because what? The goal is not clear. The goal is not clear. By contrast, is a righteous person who desires. Be careful. One person, none of their desire will be fulfilled. And another person, all their desires will be fulfilled. All their desires. One is sick and one becomes a tree of life, a source of life. And of course, the righteous person, their own desires become purified with time become cleansed with time. Just because they put their heart on God over time, all what they want becomes pure. That's why our Lord told us in Matthew 13, He says, But blessed are your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear. For assuredly I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The righteous men desired. They did not see it, but all their desires were fulfilled in heaven, and all of them were able to see the coming of Christ from heaven. So one person walks toward a final despair, and another person walks toward a, an everlasting presence of God. 
In Romans 8, 19, St. Paul tells us, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the, revealing of the Son of God. That's why it's important for us to keep in mind what is the intentions of my heart and what does really God want from me. The danger is by the time I discover this, I'll be wasting so much time trying to run after things that God has not meant for me to have it now. And this is, the scripture itself lifts us always to think about what's coming. In 1 Corinthians, for example, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised in incorruptible, and we will be changed. You see the, the image of heaven? This is where the scripture wants us to focus, the desire how many of us, their hearts desire for the kingdom of heaven? To see the heaven, to see God without a veil, for the spirit to fly with God and to love him and to walk with him and to receive his glory and to be light shining. He who despised the word will be destroyed but he who fears the commandments will be rewarded. How can somebody have good desires from verse 12? What makes people, what are the correct desires? What are the bad desires? Here he talks about the one who despises the word of God will be destroyed. But the one who fears the commandments will be rewarded. It depends on who your desires will be impacted by you reading the word of God. If you don't read the scripture, you don't have good desires. Simple as that. And sometimes people say, I don't like reading. If you don't read, you won't have good desires. If you don't have good des desires, the Bible said you'll be destroyed. If you think about this, some people truly take the commandments of God to heart. Yani, for example, Abraham when he, when strangers were, com strangers were coming over his house, and he's a rich man, he himself washed the feet of the strangers. There's a commandment in the Old Testament that you must be kind to strangers. But he went beyond what the commandment is because of how much he loves the commandment of God. There's a, a, a very holy person that I've got a chance to meet and he worked, he used to work as an engineer and somebody told me a story about him where one of his employees did something terribly wrong so he, he kind of raised his voice at him. But he told me within two minutes he felt so guilty he came back and apologized to him. This is the, the person who runs after the commandments of God. They're, they're walking by the light of God. And this is critical in their life. It's critical in our life. Those who despise the word of God and those who fear the commandment, these are the difference. The word despise means they hate it. And don't tell me to forgive. Don't tell me to love. They, this is all despise it. They don't try to entertain it. And this becomes a problem. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 25. It says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. So when somebody comes and speaks to you the word of God, do not refuse it. Because if you reject this person, well, maybe you'll be able to, but you will not be able to reject God when he comes in the second coming. First Peter 3.20 says, Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. If you look through the scripture, 
you'll find most people despise the commandment of God. And I have to be careful not to have that sense of security. Because despise the word, the word of God doesn't always come public. And for example, you have Judas, who despised the word of God, but he was hidden. People did not, did not see him. He was one of the disciples. He was entrusted with the responsibility, with service. He was a servant. He was a head servant. He was in charge of the money. He performed miracles, but yet, yet, he despised the word of God. Some people might even use a spiritual means for their own self. Some people now use like YouTube videos to do whatever they want to do, but at the end of the day, the purpose from their, from their social media or the, the YouTube is not to glorify God. It's for their own glory, for their, for their own views, for their own money they make. Some people now, because they find it easy to make money by criticizing people online, even the fathers of the church, even the Pope, they find it easy way to, um, to despise the commandment of God and use this platform to do evil. Many people also, they come in the form of virtuous acts to hide some of their sins. Like you guys remember the story of Anani and Sapphira who sold their land. They, they imagine somebody sold their own house to donate the money to the church. But their intention was not to love them because of their love to God or to the poor. Their intention was to look great in front of people. All of these actions, they might seem pure, might seem holy, but they are despising the commandment of God. It says, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. So here he's telling us that the teaching of the wise is, is like a wellspring of life. It gives like abundant life. What does it mean, abundant life? A lot of joy, a lot of renewal, a lot of, a lot of excitement. There's a beautiful story about a, a monk who used to visit uh, one of his family members in Alexandria. And his favorite story was the story of St. Marina. Every time they read to him the story of St. Marina, he weeps from how much the story impacts him. Is a fountain of life that comes with people who walk with God, with wisdom. Also, when he says here, the law of the wise is fountain of life to turn one away from it is the snares of death. We, for us here, the commandment of God is our own light during this time when we are sojourner in the world. So if I turn away from it, I will die. It's my only hope. His Holiness Pope Shenouda used to say something beautiful. He used to say, those who lift everything in the hands of God got used to seeing God's hand in everything. Those who learn to leave everything in God's hands and submit to Him and walk with Him, every day they will see God's hand. Can you imagine God is working around us and we're blinded? And God is waiting for us to trust in his promises so he can open our eyes. Like Psalm 119, it says, Open my eyes that I may see wonder, wonderful things from your law. Where I'm going to see wonderful things? From your law, from your commandments. The commandment of God is wisdom. Wisdom is not trying to uh, navigate through things for an evil mean. That's not wisdom. We, wisdom, true wisdom, is from God. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of unfaithful is hard. Good understanding gains favor. Understanding is one of the most difficult things people do. 
Because understanding requires patience. To understand somebody in front of me, you need patience. You need good intention. You actually need healthy minds. You need a desire to learn. And you also need to be grounded in the Word of God. Because you can say the wrong things at the wrong time and you can lose people. One time, Father Tedros Malati, he was visiting a house and he knocked on the door and it was the wrong house. For they opened, for the husband opened, once he saw the priest, he was like, nobody have visited us for a long time. Like, the Abuna discovered this was a Christian house. For Abuna told him, do you mind if I come drink tea? Are you sure? But don't talk about Jesus, don't talk about anything, because my wife is and does not want to talk to God. Are you sure? He walks in, his, the wife comes in, and then Abuna Tadros asks her, what do you think of Jesus? She said, I don't want to talk to him. And she took a picture of Jesus and flipped it upside down. So he's looking toward the wall. You know what Abuna told her? Abuna told her, good job. Because you love God so much, so when you're upset with him, you're expressing your feelings. Yes, you're expressing it in a way that's a bit more um, uh, personal, but, but you love him. And actually, a few weeks later, this woman came back to church and confessed and sat with, the, with Abuna. This is the idea of understanding. When you understand what are people going through, their hurt, their difficulties, this could have been an easy time to rebuke her, and tell her what you're doing is wrong. But she really, she really, he, he really understood what she was going through. Good understanding does require wisdom. Does require people to have a great grace from God to be able to move. Origen, the scholar, tells God, give me wisdom that I might taste your law with proper attention. Give me wisdom that I may taste your love with proper attention. Even understanding the scripture requires humility, requires clear intention. But it says the way of the unfaithful is hard. What does it mean, hard? The unfaithful, they might seem like they're doing the right thing, but they're very harsh, they're very difficult. They're trying to hide their true intention. It's easy for them to gossip and to lie and to stab people in the back. And they become extremely damaging. Their goal is not to edify, their goal is to destroy. The way of the, the, way of the evil actually makes people enslaved to a negative mindset. Sometimes you sit with people and all what they do is criticize, day and night. You know what it means? It means you don't spend time with the Bible. There's no light. No light in sight. Pure darkness. And this is what the Bible is, 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 it talks about. Verse 16 says, Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his fully. What does it mean? It says, the wise does not speak without knowing. You know, like the person who really knows what's going on, a lot of times you find them more reserved. But the fool speaks non-stop, non-stop. Whether they know or they don't know, they speak. They just want to talk. The wise usually covers his knowledge so he can use it at the right time. He can make it in an effective way. Our Lord Jesus Christ, for example, he knew that not in every situation he can share knowledge with people. Sometime he preferred to be silent. Actually, one of the verses in John 2.23, he says, he did not commit himself to them. He says, because Jesus knew what, is, what was in human beings, he did not commit himself to them. Like Jesus knew that he could not trust people at that time. He knew their weaknesses. So, he says here, every prudent man acts with knowledge. There is a clear understanding of how they behave. Somebody was telling me yesterday, they said, uh, I set boundaries with people 
but other people breaks it, break it. So I told them, you can't set boundaries that there is dependent on another person. When you set boundaries, it, it's dependent on you. Like let's say you set a boundary that I will text this person once a day. If they text me 50 times a day, I'm still texting them once a day. This is a boundary that you put for your own self. It's different than the boundaries that I wanna, I'm expecting the other person to put. People who are, people who are wise, they're able to understand people in front of them and able to accept them. The problem is, and this is a common problem, even when dealing with relationships, most people either think the group they love are sinless and holy, and the group they don't like are evil. But no, the prudent understands when to rely on every person, and he knows to bring the, person, the good out of every person, to bring the best out of every person. And that's important in how we approach this. Also, we know, for example, if we go, if you go with this, you find also the saints were very careful about how and who to spend time with, with because it, it protects them and who they open their heart to. The fact of wisdom is important. He says here, every prudent man acts with knowledge. They understand what they understand their own weaknesses and understand who to interact with. That's why, for example, First Corinthians says what? But now I have written to you to keep, to, to you not to keep company with anyone named the brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or rival or drunken. In the scripture itself, those who are knowledgeable, they know that the Bible gives them instruction on who to trust and who to spend time with. And this becomes an important aspect of their life. They also learn how to bear with difficult times. One of the, one of the Western saints, she was going through a difficult time and people were really bullying her. And she said, she said something beautiful. She said, this is when she was mistreated. She said, I then answered immediately, Jesus, I ask, I, she, when Jesus appeared to her, she told him, I accept everything that you wish to send me. I trust in your goodness. She said, at that moment, I felt that by this act, I glorified God greatly, but I armed myself with patience. As soon as I left the chapel, I had an encounter with reality. I do not want to describe the details, but there was much of it as I, I was able to bear. So what is happening here? A person who's prudent is able to understand the reality around them. And they're able to understand their own weakness and their own vulnerability. And they understand how they need to spend time with God and able to face the world. And when they face the world, they understand the warfare that's around them. The fully is somebody who talks, 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 preaches, 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 preaches. But none of, none of that stuff reflects any of his practice or any understanding. Uh, let's do one more verse. It says, A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask parents with kids, and if you can just please uh, and take them outside if they're making noise. says, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. Who is a wicked messenger? A, me a wicked messenger, somebody who does not present the person of Christ. They, are, they could be in the environment, a Christian environment, but they do not represent the, 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 the person of Christ. Like somebody, for example, who gets upset when people speak highly of other servants, or they get jealous when another church opens nearby, or their main focus becomes on the number of kids that are coming. Or, for example, they care so much about taking kids out to be close to them and have fun with them, but not connecting them with the Bible. Sometimes also you see this with parents, where the parents feel so comfortable that the kids open their heart to them about everything, even though if these kids are not walking with God. They'd be like, the kid doesn't come to church, he doesn't read his Bible, but don't worry, Bona, they open their heart to me, I know everything about them. 
Okay, and, and then what? The parent feels comfortable that the kid tells them everything, but their life doesn't reflect a life with God. The messenger, as a parent, are just satisfying their own anxiety, but not bringing the person close to God. In the ancient Near East, messenger actually were professionally trained to a very high standard. They had to be courageous, they had to be bold, they had to actually learn military tactics. They were extremely, extremely trained. You know, to the point that the messenger can speak and say, I. Like if a, a king sends a messenger to another king, the messenger can speak as if the king that he sent him speaks. So here, we have to be careful. Because if you say, who is a messenger? Sunday school servant is a messenger. The deacons are messengers. Clergy are messengers. Parents, students. You are a student and you are the only messenger to the people you meet every day. And that's extremely important in our spiritual life. But, but a faithful ambassador brings health. When somebody shares the correct message of God, what's going to happen? People will be healed. People will be what? Will be healed. People will return to God. People are truly, truly hungry for a holy life, for a life with God. And that's critical, critical in our life. And you know, like um, there's a, for example, in, the, in the, one of the parables that the Lord talked about, about one of his servants who was a bad ambassador. And the Lord told him what? Told him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap what I have not sown and gather what I have not scattered seeds. People who are wrong ambassadors could actually bring death to other people. And actually, you see this sometimes, for example, where people might be raised in a church, in a house that is Christian, but the, 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 the parental life does not reflect a Christian household. Or maybe like you come to church and the deacons who are leading are playing with their phones. They're, they're people who are, who, are, who, are un, uh, who are bad messengers to the God they represent. But a, a good ambassador brings light, brings holiness, brings joy. And a good ambassador is not somebody who intellectually knows. It's somebody who practices it. It's somebody who lives it. Not somebody who can recite some things they learned when they were a child. It's somebody who enjoys God and are enlightened by the word of God and they're able to spread light to others and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.